So, I hear that you guys are very hot on property rights. Is that, is that right? I hope this includes intellectual property, because I'm about to share with you a fantastic reality TV format that I thought up recently. And if anyone is not sure about property rights, I thought it up with a lawyer. So, so be warned. If that's my mum, actually won't be, she's dead. Um, so, well, I'm sorry. It's a traditional stand-up comedy line, and I only remembered halfway through that it was wildly inappropriate. I don't know why you're shocked. It's my mum. She'd think it was really funny as it goes. Anyway, uh, back to where we were. Yeah, so I, so what, let me tell you the story. So I'm talking to uh, my solicitor, and he, for some reason, probably because, either because I was coming here or because I made a radio program about the singularity, uh, we started talking about the robots taking people's jobs. And he said, yeah, I feel really sorry for all like the steel workers who are now redundant because robots do their jobs much cheaper and safer and quicker and better. And I said to him, don't get too complacent because your job is next. And I don't know if you spotted, it's a news story only last week, the world's first robot lawyer, that will appeal parking tickets for you. <laughs> There's the person who gets a lot of parking tickets. He goes, ooh, <laughs> excellent. Yeah, so if you get a lot of parking or speeding tickets, uh, this is where you need to go. And it's basically somebody in America who gets a lot of parking tickets wrote an algorithm to appeal them. And, uh, and you can go online, and it asks you some questions. It's basically an artificial intelligence. It asks you some questions, it goes through, and it will file an appeal on your behalf uh, according to what you've told it. So it's by no means just people in manual jobs who are getting their jobs taken by robots. Artificial intelligence is taking jobs of people in suits as well, uh, white-collar jobs, I think they're traditionally called. So. Uh, so as a result of this conversation, uh, I don't know if this is what you're meant to pay your solicitor hundreds of pounds an hour to do, but we came up with this great game show idea where you simulate the world of the future in which robots have taken 90% of the jobs and 10% uh, are billionaires living in their gated communities on the profits and the rest of us are roaming feral in the landscape with no employment and no access to resources. And you have teams of different professions basically fighting it out to see who survives the best. Will it be the steel workers with their, their manual skills and their practical resourcefulness and their, their physical strength? Or will it be the lawyers with their mental skills and their low cunning? Well, obviously, it'll be the lawyers. That's what my solicitor convinced me of. Uh, but. Amusing though this was to us uh, as a scenario, I don't think it's going to happen, and I will come back to why. So, will the robots take our jobs? Well, as I'm sure you know, they already are. Uh, is, this, is this a good or a bad thing? Well, I want to look backwards first. I was in San Leandro earlier this year, which is in, uh, it's not exactly in Silicon Valley, it's in the Bay Area, it's kind of across the bay from San Francisco, it's a small town. Uh, it was the home, as I discovered while I was there, um, we were, it was for future proofing, in fact, we were recording radio, it was where the first mechanical tractor was invented, and it had Caterpillar tracks, and they founded the Caterpillar company, and this is where they made those tractors. And and we were talking with the, the local, they have an innovation officer on their council, and we were talking to her about what an amazing transformation that was for agriculture in America and worldwide, that you went from being animal powered to being powered by fossil fuels, essentially first steam and then, uh, and then oil. And I know that at its peak, a third of the agricultural land in America was used for fodder for horses, because that was how you powered everything in agriculture. So you imagine, when you go to fossil fuels, suddenly you've got a third of the agricultural land freed up to grow food for people, and, and what a transformation that was. So yeah, pretty annoying for all the people who worked with horses and in the associated trades of horses, but when we look back from now, thank you ancestors for going over from horses to fossil fuels, because it's made our lives a lot better. 
Uh, and for another example, in fact, my, my granddad, no, my great granddad and a lot of my great uncles worked on the docks in Grimsby. One of them was a deal porter, which basically meant he carried wood out of the holds of ships. That was his working life. He carried immense lengths of timber. His wife, my mum told me this, his wife, before she died, uh, his wife made him silk pads to go under his shirt, these silk pads, and she would sew them because otherwise carrying wood on his shoulder all day, every day, would, you know, it would break the skin, it would draw blood. It was, it was no life. So the fact that the jobs of people like that are now taken by people driving cranes uh, and containers is, I think, something to celebrate in spite of the fact that lots of, lots of dockers lost their jobs. So yeah, there is definitely a trajectory of what it used to be okay to call progress behind this handing over of jobs from the physical labor of people or animals or even some of the mental labor of people to machines. Uh, but I'd like to throw in a couple of caveats at this point. One of them is that in past times when the indoor industrial revolutions and, different, and some sectors went to the wall and new sectors sprung up, there was economic dynamism, there was economic growth. When, when the horses became redundant and everything went over to steam and then internal combustion engines, there was enormous economic expansion and dynamism and people wanting to invest in setting up new industries. And I'm not convinced that that is the case now. So I don't think we can be complacent about saying, it's all right if you lose your job because there'll be another job. I don't think that's a given. I think that is something that we need to work for and, and fight for. Um, and, and that's part of a broader thing that I think we need to worry about. The reason we were in San Leandro was nothing to do with the seam tractor, because we only, in that program, we only look at the future. We were there because they're building a microgrid, um, which was, so they're building a kind of new industrial park, technology park, with new housing attached to it, and it'll all have solar panels and it is California, so they get plenty of sunshine. But it'll be controlled by this microgrid, uh, which is very smart. And part of what it will do is to shift energy from where it's being produced to where it's needed. So at weekends, the offices will have solar panels producing electricity, but nobody's at work, so they'll send it to the housing. During the day, they assume the housing people are, is empty because people are at work and they will shift the energy from there to the offices and so on. They'll move it around, it's all very efficient, they'll move it to storage. But the microgrid is also there to train people to use power when there is energy available to wash, do laundry when the sun shines, if you like, and not to use it when it's not available. And some of this will happen automatically, that your washing machine maybe will be hooked up to the grid and the grid will say, it's not very sunny, don't do the washing until later on or lots of people in the offices are using energy, don't do the washing until later on. But it's generally part of a pattern, not of changing industry to be able to give us all more of everything, but to be able to do more with less, or even the same with less, often the same with less. So it's about managing demand rather than improving supply. And this is one of the things that I think we should have a wary eye when some of the cognitive jobs, if you like, that are currently done by humans are handed over to artificial intelligences, to, to machines. And there's, part of this is because it lends itself terribly well to nudge, which I dare say you've been discussing earlier this weekend. Uh, and to generally saying, well, there's a smart system here, there's a smart city, it's smarter than people are, so we can, we can train people to be a bit more efficient, a bit more green, whatever it is, just by letting the machines make the decisions. We don't, we don't need to enlist everybody and get everybody on board. We can let the machines nudge them in the right direction. And, and then it goes further than that. So, for example, in America, there is much more, much more than here, there's a lot of use of algorithms in the justice system. And some of the motivation with this is great. They recognize that they imprison a lot of people in America, far too many people. And there, so there is a move to say, well, look, all of these people can't be going to reoffend. Do we need to lock them all up? What if we had some way of predicting who's going to reoffend and who isn't? So they have algorithms to predict who are the people at high risk of reoffending. 
and who are the people at low risk of reoffending. And they use those to assign scores to people who've been convicted or possibly people who are up for a parole. And based on those scores, then they make decisions about who will go to jail and who won't. And you can see the appeal of this if you're in the justice system, if you're a judge, uh, or if you're a parole officer, because you don't have to carry the can if you turn out to be wrong. If you free somebody and then they do go on to reoffend and they kill somebody, you can turn around and say, well, what can I do? The algorithm said that they were at low risk of reoffending. So it lets you off the hook slightly. And you can see that it would seem very objective. If you've got a machine that's terribly clever and puts in millions of data points, I have just written a book called Big Data, so you have to forgive me for mentioning the data points. You can see that it looks like, well, that's obviously much more objective than us. I'm a human being. I'm flawed. Can my judgment ever be anything but partial? Whereas this machine sees everything. It's kind of like a technological oracle. And so the machine is going to look back at the, the history of who has reoffended in the past and make predictions about who's going to reoffend in the future. So it looks objective. In fact, it's not very objective. Uh, a publication called ProPublica in America did some very good investigative journalism uh, and found that actually this, the algorithm in use across large parts of America to predict who's going to reoffend is not very objective at all. Uh, if you're black, for example, it's at least twice as likely to wrongly predict that you will reoffend. If you're white, it's at least twice as likely to wrongly predict that you won't reoffend. Now, it seems unlikely they will actively feed in uh, categories like race when they're writing the algorithm, but nobody really knows how it works partly because it relies on machine learning, which is where you give the machine a lot of data from the past and ask it to extrapolate to the future. So you don't actually know what criteria the machine is using, and partly because it's a proprietary algorithm. And the company that have spent money developing it don't want it to be publicly examinable because that's their intellectual property. Uh, so we come to the problem then that it's not really accountable. And, and what do you do about that? With a human being, yes, we may all be flawed and our knowledge may be partial, but at least a judge can stand there and you can say, well, why did you make that decision? On what grounds did you decide that person should go to jail? And the judge can be accountable for their decision and you can appeal against it and query it. And, and this is where I think we should worry about robots taking our jobs, not just because there are people in this room who are law students or whatever thinking, well, I thought I was safe. I thought, you know, I did the right thing, not becoming a steel worker, and now some robot's going to take my job. But because it, I think it betrays uh, attitudes, underlying attitudes that we should worry about. And this is why I think that it won't actually happen, that we'll be left in this, this kind of post-feral landscape with robots doing everything and the rest of us just roaming around in teams. Although I still think it would make a great game show. You just, just picture to yourself all the fighter pilots who've been replaced by autonomous drones battling it out with the ex-porn stars who've been replaced with virtual reality avatars. And try and tell me you would not watch that show. So until they write the algorithm that comes up with game show ideas, I, I think I'm pretty safe with that one. But the, but the reason I think it won't happen is that although machines can be very good at emulating really narrow sections of human thought, really, really good. I mean, it's beaten us at things like Go, uh, at, at game shows. It can be incredibly good at mathematical reasoning, obviously, and at spotting patterns. It's incredibly useful in research. Don't get me wrong, I, I am in favor of using big data. It's a fantastic tool to expand what we can do. But it doesn't have the capacity for thinking that, that we have. And uh, I'm going to, uh, I mean, I don't know what you're like in the mornings. I'm, I'm not a morning person. I'm quite slow in the mornings. But nevertheless, I do incredible amount. I'm also not good at multitasking. But I do incredible amount of things at once. I can get up. Uh, I can have a shower, I can make tea, I can shout at the radio. 
if my flatmate's in the shower before me, I can change the order of things. I can make tea and then have a shower and shout at the radio. And then I can read the emotions in his face when he comes out of the shower and finds me shouting at the radio and apologize to him. And all at the same time, I'm actually planning ahead. I'm wondering what went wrong with my life, that I'm still sharing a flat at my age. I mean, I'm just, I'm doing whole kind of multi-level thinking. And robots, frankly, can't even have a shower, make tea, and go upstairs. And I know this because I have a roboticist friend who I ask every year, where's the robot's going to bring me tea? So they're a way off even being able to do all the things that a person can do. When you actually step back and think what else is involved in being a person, our sense of purpose, our, our sense of existing in the world in which we act, robots can't have any of that. And, and I know there's usually somebody in the audience thinking, listen, I've seen some really clever AI, and I can tell you the singularity is seven years off or, or whatever. And I always ask the same question, if the robots are so smart, why aren't they having the events to discuss them taking our jobs? Because they cannot think on that level. Only human beings can think on that level. And that's why human judgment is, is so important. So, Maybe I'm cheating a bit here, because I'm, I'm not really going to answer the question, will robots take our jobs, except to put in a plea that when it comes to certain really important things, we shouldn't let them take our jobs. Because the very move to hand over incredibly important things like decisions in the justice system to an algorithm tells you less about what machines can actually do and much more about how you see your fellow human beings. Do you think your fellow human beings are capable of exercising judgment? Do you think, both, both experts, by the way, both people like judges or doctors, but also each other. Do you think your fellow human beings are capable of judging when to turn the washing machine on? Do you think we're capable of having a civilized conversation about what to do as a society about energy supply? Well, if you don't, then you possibly do think that an AI would do a better job. But Let's at least be frank that that's what underlies it. So actually, I suppose I am going to answer the question finally, because if you say, are robots going to take our jobs? Obviously, the answer is no. A robot's not going to do anything. A robot is just a tool, it's just a machine. It might be that a person takes your job and hands it over to a robot or an algorithm. And in some cases, though that might be really bad for you, it might be part of a trajectory that's a good thing for the rest of society, the kind of thing that's brought us to the being indoors in a nice heated or air-conditioned place where we're all literate and we can have conversations and we have smartphones and we can travel the world and all the, the joys of modernity. But it might be that someone's taking your job to give it to a robot because they don't trust you as a human being. And that's where I think we need to push back. Thank you.